I started working at my current summer part-time job last spring. I am situated in a large old building that used to be a country club, but fell into despair about 10 years ago. Although there's nothing paranormal about my story, it is maybe worth mentioning that the former manager killed himself in the main office upstairs when they went out of business. It adds to the unsettling quality of this place. Along with that, so do the seemingly never-ending hallways and passages, innumerable hidey holes and half-empty pools, and other strange, unused parts of the building, like a secret shower room and sauna, and a tunnel of storage areas that connects the men and women's bathrooms. There are also a lot of doors to the outside in this place. It makes sense for a country club, but currently, we only use one small room for the golf course check-in, the kitchen, and one dining room for the upstairs, and the small cafe area for early morning golfers to get their coffee and beer. The cafe area is where I work. In the summer, we clock in to open the cafe before 6 a.m., often before the sun comes up. The golf course people come in pretty shortly after, but I would be the first person in the building every morning. I would unlock the front door, disarm the lock, walk downstairs in the dark, unlock this cage that keeps the drunkies at the bar upstairs at night from wandering downstairs, and crawl along a long dark hallway with no windows to get to the light switch at the end of the hall. This always creeps me out, and I end up holding my keys between my fingers like brass knuckles. I act like a ninja sliding down the walls on the opposite side of whatever doorway is coming up just because it's pitch black, and uh, I'm a scaredy bear. By the time I get to the end of the hall and flip the light on, my heart is always pounding out of my chest as I struggle to find the right key to let me into the cab. The whole situation started when Tim, a golf course employee, mentioned that he kept shutting the door between the men's locker room bathroom and the storage area that leads to the women's, and every time he would go back in there, it would be open again. This, along with some strange noises, was fodder for the bar regulars upstairs to claim this place was haunted by the old manager and whomever else they say died within these halls. Travis, a co-worker in the cafe, also mentioned that a few minutes after he opened, he went into the men's locker room and noticed that it was all steamy and smelled like soap, so he went into the shower room to investigate. Everything was sopping wet and still hot. He was the only person who was supposed to be there at that time of day. But he didn't see anyone, so he let it go. A couple of months later, Tim noticed this weird side door that you had to climb up a rickety old staircase on the side of the building, and it wasn't shutting correctly. So he fixed it, and it locked correctly, and he didn't think anything more of it. Shortly after, someone from the golf course came over to tell me they found someone's entire life packed away in one of the hundreds of lockers that no one uses. They thought someone was living in the storage room between the men's and women's bathrooms. He must have been coming in before the golf course people set the alarms when they left in the evenings, and after the cafe person, me, would come in and turn the alarm off in the morning. So that means that every morning, as I blindly shuffled my way down that long dark hallway alone, one of those pitch black doorways actually did have someone hiding behind it. A few days later, a red-faced, angry, bald man wearing Vietnam-era army issue sunglasses came into the cafe and started screaming, puffing, and flailing his arms around, yelling about his stuff getting thrown out. He went over to berate the golf course people, so they asked him about the contents of the locker. His answers about specific items led them to realize that this was the man who was secretly living in one of the building's many dark passageways. I never found out much about him, whether he was dangerous or just homeless, but watching him scream about his stuff made it clear that he wasn't 100% rational. I still work there and do a darkness shuffle down the hallway every morning when I work. And although they say everything is on the up and up with the alarms and the doors locking, it still creeps me the hell out. And on a Monday, I noticed a pad of paper and a long metal pair of tweezers clipped underneath the stairs. 
and I thought it probably had something to do with inventory, because right before, the manager came in to count our foodstuffs and beverages. It wasn't an area that's easily accessed by customers, but it's not technically locked in any way during the day. And today, my friend who works at the bar upstairs told me that someone brought this pad to her. It has lots of stuff about how electric cars work to support some kind of government agenda surrounding social media and some plans to patent for some sort of alternative energy source that involve the UN and foreign passports. This is the part of the building that is not under video surveillance, so I have no idea who left it and if they were planning on coming back or not. It could be the same guy from before. He seemed pretty unhinged and definitely likely to spend a lot of time in weird parts of this building. Hello. I would like to tell you of an encounter that resulted in a serious amount of fear and pain. A full, paralyzing fear where you just sink into yourself while your body shakes because you're so scared. As for pain, I would not feel any physical pain until the end of this event, but I can speak on a different pain, a distinct feeling that presents itself before the floodgates of pain flow in. I found myself on a seesaw of fear, not wanting to climb any higher, but to get off altogether. But higher and higher I went, fear looking up at me with a smile as it propels me to experience fears I never thought I would experience. Fear of getting arrested, fear of getting robbed, fear of dying, and lastly, fear I may have to kill someone. To start off with, I'm what you would call a sex addict. Now I know identifying yourself as a sex addict comes off a bit silly, but after years of serious reflection and confrontation with traumatic events in my life, I feel as if the explanation fits my compulsions. It's not so much the act of it that I crave. The reason why I identify myself as one is, at some point in my life, I replace a search for emotional affection to feel fulfillment and happiness with the need for physical encounters. That hit of dopamine was all I needed. It is as if my ability to trust has been completely eradicated and the common traits that so many look for in relationships are unnecessary to me to be happy. Instead, I can just hook up with someone. No emotions, no insecurities, no pressure. All the things that can hurt me or make me vulnerable are gone. The only comparison I can make is to a drug addict. The drug is enough. That short high temporarily gives you all you need without having to face any emotions, whether it be your past, present or future. You can physically impose something to make you feel good. It's quite the oxymoron in that while the world views you as out of control, what drives my drug is the sense of control. However, what scares me about my sexual compulsions is what I'm willing to do to get that physical encounter I crave. I've never had a type which certainly helps, and without sounding like an asshole, I do rather well with the ladies. I'm not bad looking, educated, have my own house, and I respect women. I need to make that point clear because I don't want any listeners to think my urge for physical relationships drives me to insanity and that I violate women. Absolutely not. My angle is the intelligent nice guy. I don't have all the confidence in the world and certainly will not approach anyone, but I can hold a conversation and can be charming. Something I'm ashamed of is I believe I can be a true wolf in sheep's clothing. Most women believe they've met a guy who is committed and wants monogamy and love. I cowardly admit I rarely come out and let women know my true intentions. While my success rate is fair, it is still not the easiest thing to just randomly go out and pick a woman up for sex. Sure, I have done it, but mostly every time was the one out of a million times I actually wasn't looking to bring someone home. My go-to was Tinder because honestly, it worked really well for me. I'm a talker, and Tinder allows for conversations to start without having to confront all the other insecurities men and women face while trying to approach a stranger at a bar or somewhere random. However, the night I speak of, I wasn't getting any hits. I first started my night by going out. 
I had a few beers and looked for women to talk to, but the bars were empty and those there did not look like they wanted to be approached. Again, my game is not to bother you. I can take a hint, and if you're out with the ladies and want nothing to do with men, I surely won't get in your way. While at the bar, I'm also checking Tinder to see if anyone has replied to my dumb ice-breaking jokes or responses reflective to their profiles. I wasn't receiving any responses. Then a thought I'm not proud of pops into my head and I will admit it wouldn't be the first time I've thought about it. My thought was, maybe I should go pick up a prostitute. The town next to where I live has an insane amount of drug use, and poor souls who have the evil that is addiction often resort to desperate measures to secure money for their next fix. I hope you would believe me that when addressing my thought process, you must consider what my own addiction is and what it does to that thought process. I am sympathetic to women and know for most, selling your body is like selling a piece of your soul. However, my urges cloud the mind and you just don't think the way you would normally. In the past, I've driven around and even let women approach my car, but I've never actually went through with it. I was always able to let reason and empathy in to convince me not to do it and just go home. However, on this night, I had a strong buzz and I smoked a joint when I got back to my car. I was already feeling good from a couple of drinks, but after the joint, I fell into a trance. I would do it. Tonight is the night. If given the opportunity, I'm going to pay for sex. I drove around for a couple of hours and easily saw three or four women who eagerly try to catch your eye as you drive past them, looking for a head nod or a quick flash of lights to signal that you know the deal and want to go. Like the other nights, I couldn't bring myself to do it, partly because the women out were aggressively marching down the street. They looked sad, agitated, in a hurry, dirty. I was already nervous, and the image I was playing in my head on how this would all go down was not like this. Deep down, I know there was some shame, and these women looked like they were going through it. So, just like other nights, empathy and shame convinced me to go home. On my way, I was far from the Broadway Strip, where you will find what you're looking for. It was easily 3.30 a.m., and I was approaching a four-way stop sign in a completely different town, when I saw a young woman standing by the stop sign. This area is very different than the Strip. On the Strip, it's very busy, and it's nearly impossible not to be seen. Here, it was dark, and not a car in sight. She was wearing a club-style dress. She looked nothing like other women I'd seen. She was younger, looked closer to my age, and was just standing there. I pulled up to the stop sign, not knowing if she was a prostitute or not. I tried to play it cool and casually look her way. She looked back at me and then turned her head. I took this as she's a woman just waiting for a ride or something and started to drive away when I heard, Hey, do you want to hang out? I will admit, when I heard her speak, I was taken aback. In seconds, my heart went from a gentle beat to an aggressive, quickening drum. I stopped in the middle of a four-way and began to quiver. I grew cold and felt stiff as she approached my car. I looked in all directions, ready to floor it if I saw any headlights. Boom, boom, boom. My heart thumped hard as she couldn't have taken any longer to walk ten feet. When she opened my door, I could see her better. She was really pretty. And in that moment, I thought she wasn't a hooker, but a girl who just gets in random guys' cars. I know it's stupid, but it was my thought at the time. I pulled off and tried to relax. My arms were still stiff, and my neck and shoulders were flexed, to the point her first words were, Are you okay? I assured her I was, but I was actually losing it. I thought any second now a cop's gonna pull up and arrest me and I'm going to end up in a paper or some registry and my life is ruined. Any set of lights scared the shit out of me, and I would shrink as I passed. I asked her how her night was because I could not think of anything else to start off with. She told me she was waiting for a friend, but it's really cold outside, and when she saw me, she thought I could give her a ride. Again, perhaps I was being dumb, but I believed her. I asked where she needed to go, and she told me it was back the way I came. She then said for the ride she would do me an extra special favor. I'm sure you can all guess what that was. 
Admittedly, I was more relaxed once I knew the situation I was in. I still didn't know what to say. I just sat back and let her tell me where to go. My thought that this whole experience was actually easy and not weird quickly changed once I realized this woman had some issues. She was talking a lot and about the most random stuff. She had a lisp and could not sit still. It was freaking me out and I wanted to ask her to sit still, but I was afraid of her reaction. She was no longer the still, calm woman I saw for a whole ten seconds standing at that stop sign. I got a bad feeling in my gut. She asked me if I had any drugs. I told her I had a half a joint she could have. She looked at me and got annoyed. She wanted heroin, not weed. I told her I don't do that and she interrupted me. She said she could get us some. I refused and kept on asking where I needed to bring her. She would point in some random directions and say I took the wrong turn, or she thought a street was actually another street. After realizing I'm a fucking idiot, and I now have this lady in my car, I no longer wanted what I wanted when I picked her up. I told her I wasn't interested in the special favor she would do to me, and I would bring her to a destination if she would tell me where it is. Anytime I hinted at dropping her off, she would tell me to pull over so she could do to me what she said she would, but I would refuse and say I'm good. I kept asking, can I drop you off here? To which she would reply, no baby, please, I'm lost, but I will find the way. Please, I'm so good you won't regret it. Let's party, you can come in and we can do whatever you want. I would be lying if every time she dropped a sex reference I didn't consider it, but her behavior was so fucked up that I would bring myself back to reality and refuse. I was growing impatient and pulled over. I asked her to get out of my car, but she refused. What the fuck did I get myself into, I thought. Like seriously, have any of you listeners actually had to get someone out of your car? A stranger at that, in the middle of the night. She was acting erratic and seemed one touch away from screaming and losing it. I did not want to draw any attention to myself. We were in a neighborhood and I knew if she screamed, someone would hear and call the cops. I also didn't want to drive far away because that seemed like a bad idea. I thought this would be an easy transaction, but I was wrong and had an unstable woman reaching for my belt, ignoring all my requests for her to leave my car. No, no, no. I told you I'm good. I just want to get you out of my car. She wouldn't respond. She just sat back and grunted, then half whined like a child and rolled her eyes before reaching for my pants again. I said no, please just get out of my car. I will pay you to get out of my car. This got her attention and she asked how much. I told her 20 bucks and she didn't have to do anything. Just get out. She sat there for a minute and said she would, but I needed to drop her off at her house. This was so fucking frustrating. I desperately wanted this night to be over and was trying to patiently guide it to a close, avoiding anything crazier than the situation I was already in. I agreed and we pulled off in the direction we came. We were about 20 minutes from where I originally picked her up and while driving, I was getting really scared. I hadn't prepared myself for this. I felt stuck and at the mercy to this woman in my car. While driving, I heard a lighter ignite, and when I looked over, she was smoking a pipe, twirling it in a circle as the flames touched the glass tip. I freaked out and yelled, What are you doing? She just looked at me and exhaled a large amount of smoke. It's hard to describe what it tastes like, but it was not weed. Meth or heroin, perhaps, but I don't really know. I immediately rolled down my windows and noticed that I was approaching the four-way stop sign where I picked her up. I pulled over into an apartment complex and told her to get the fuck out of my car. She looked at me and said, hold on, hold on, I need to call my friend, I forget what building he's in. I thought, no fucking way, I was not going to sit here and wait for a guy to come out and probably rob me. Get out, get out, get out of the fucking car right now. I was losing it. My heart was racing and I just didn't care anymore. I kept yelling louder and louder until I heard a loud thump sound near my ear on the left side. I jumped and looked to my left. There was a man outside punching my window and pulling at my door handle. I let out a half scream and grunt as I was so scared and confused. 
I will admit things are a bit fuzzy from here on. My adrenaline was through the roof, and I only remember bits and pieces of what happened next. I remember looking over at the woman, and she was trying to unlock the passenger door, probably to let the guy in. I'm pretty sure she got it open, but I threw the car in reverse and hit the gas. Thank God there were no cars behind me, because I was not looking as I reversed. I remember the woman trying to get out of the car, but I was picking up speed, because by then, I put it into drive and floored it out of the complex parking lot. It was like we both realized at the same time we were both still in the car. I was going about 45 to 50 miles per hour and slowing down at the same rate my brain was trying to figure out what the fuck do I do next. That's when I heard it. A thud followed by a sort of tearing sound. I felt waves of pressure on my shoulder near my collarbone. When I tilted my head, I realized the woman was stabbing me. I assumed it was a knife, and I thought to myself, I'm dead. I'm fucking dead. I slammed on the brakes and reached for the knife. She was going nuts, screaming and punching at me. One of us must have hit the radio on which connects to my phone, and it was playing a song from a playlist. I had the volume up when I shut it off, so when it turned on, it was blaring. I was listening to an 80s essential playlist, and over the speakers blurred Material Girl by Madonna. I completely stopped my car and sort of blacked out. I remember her screaming bloody murder and clawing at my face. I also remember getting a hold of her arms, but this made her thrust her body over the middle console and just shake and squirm. She was a lot stronger than I would have ever expected. A switch must have been flipped because I decided or realized I was fighting back. I gave this woman a clean three-piece and it slowed her momentum down for a second before lunging at me again. I remember thinking, why are you fighting me? I would let her go no problem. I wasn't trying to hurt her. The thought then crossed my mind, I may have to kill her. Because even though I wasn't feeling it, I know I'd just been stabbed and was waiting to feel a blade plunge into my chest or stomach. I grabbed her by the throat and started to squeeze. Anger flowing from my face to my hands as I gripped tighter. I was yelling, you fucking bitch. Thank the stars I was brought out of that rage quickly, because in a blink of an eye, I realized my anger and let up on my grip. She was coughing and was now trying to leave. I unlocked the door and watched her roll out of the car. I sped off with the door still open and raced home. I realized my heart was racing and I had tears running down my face. I pulled over halfway home and inspected myself. I went for my shoulder, and to my surprise, I wasn't stabbed with a knife. I was cut, but barely. Looking on the seat, I realized she was stabbing me with a small screwdriver I kept on the side of the door. My shoulder throbbed in pain, and I was bleeding from the punctures, but they were not serious. I also found a cell phone and crack pipe. I threw both out of the window. I jumped in the shower and immediately went to bed shaking the whole time. I was exhausted, and when I woke up, my entire shoulder was bruised, and so were parts of my chest where she must have also hit me. I was ashamed for a few days and prayed I didn't hurt her. I took full responsibility for that night. I believed it was karma for attempting to take advantage of a sick person. Thankfully, I saw this woman again walking down the strip. I felt a huge sense of relief watching her walk down the road. She looked right at me and didn't flinch. I'm not saying she would have recognized me, but in that moment, she didn't. I can easily say I would never do anything like that again, and for peace of mind, I started seeing a therapist about my urges I feel. It was real embarrassing admitting certain things at first, but it got a lot easier and has helped me practice a stronger, more rational thought process. When I desire sex... Back in the early to mid-80s, I had a paper route in a medium-sized southwestern Pennsylvania town. This would have to have happened in either 83 or 84. I was 13 or 14, depending on that year. I was out one night collecting the subscription fees from my customers. It was winter because I remember that the sky was dark. I don't remember there being any snow on the ground, but I was usually done collecting by 6.30pm. 
That was on purpose, because the penguins usually came on at around 7pm. It was cold, and I decided that I wanted a hot chocolate for the walk home. There was a convenience store near my paper route. Even now, at night, the area is fairly busy with crosstown traffic for a dead-end southwestern Pennsylvania town. Well, I'd headed on over to the store and got myself a nice cup of hot chocolate. I paid it. As I was walking out into the parking lot, a guy in a pickup truck with a cap over the bed called me over. I figured, for some reason, that he recognized my paperboy receipt book, and he thought I might know the area. Thirteen-year-old logic, I guess. I supposed he was going to ask me for directions. There was some traffic, and the lot was well lit, so I didn't feel any fear. I headed over to the truck, and there were three occupants. The guy, much older than me, but not as old as my dad, and two cute girls who I recognized were older than me, but I don't know how much older. The guy looks straight at me and says, These girls want a party. Get in. And that's a direct quote. I will never forget it. Now, I'm 13 or 14, pimply as hell, and I weighed about 95 pounds soaking wet, with 20 pounds of sand in my pocket. These two chicks want to party with me. Sure, it doesn't take much for a teen boy to start pitching a tent. But I'd seen a lot of videos in high school. This shit was just screaming stranger danger. I politely declined and started walking towards home. The guy sweetens the, uh, pot, I guess. Hey, she really thinks you're cute and we'd have weed and beer. Just get in and let's go. I again politely decline. This whole time the girls have said nothing. I started walking up the road towards my house, and the guy pulled out of the lot and started following me in his truck. A couple of hundred feet up the road, a railroad bridge with a retaining wall crossed over the road they were on, and on the other side I could go through a very small wooded area and into my neighborhood. I went up the embankment and started crossing the tracks. I could see down onto the road, and the guy was leaning out of his truck window and looking back at me. Well, I kept walking, and I saw him pass the first turn into my neighborhood. Good. I was home free. My house was three blocks up from the bottom of the hill, and I ran like fuck. I got to the third block, and what comes over the crest of the hill? A pickup. I wasn't moving very quickly or anything so I easily made it to the front porch of our duplex before it passed. I told my dad about it a couple of days later, and he freaked out. For about a month, he insisted on driving along my paper route until I was done. The first time a guy in a car pulled up alongside me and asked me if he could buy an extra paper off me, my dad pulled up and yelled at him to move along. But I never saw that truck again. So, for some context, I'm a 19-year-old woman, and I moved back into my mother's house late last year. I have a 50 or 60-ish male neighbor who I've caught watching me almost every day for the past few months now, maybe since January or February. The way our houses are laid out is a little confusing. My backyard ends on the side of his house and yard, so the front of my house is pointed to the side of his. My room's window faces the ground level, so I have a direct view of the side of his property. What he will do is stand outside when he smokes, and the whole time his body will be facing my direction. When I first started noticing it, I shrugged it off as him looking at the sky or mountains behind my house, or maybe he was zoned out. But after a while, I noticed that he didn't try to look in any other direction when I'm in my room. Soon it was just about every day I could count on seeing him outside, looking into my window. I was getting sick of it. I started by hiding when I would see him, then shutting the blinds on him and opening them up after he left, then staring back at him and then flipping him off. He knew I had noticed. Now he would scurry away behind the corner of his house when I protested. At this point, 
He knows I've seen him multiple times and that I don't like him. Now, the other day was different. I had taken the screen out of my window so that my cats could come in and out as they please. One of them has abandonment issues and won't go outside without someone close. So now, seeing me through my window was even easier. My younger brother was in the back working on our garden, and I was leaning out of the window chatting with him. I looked up and saw the guy, half hidden behind his house, facing right toward me. My annoyance and anger had reached a breaking point. I yelled at him across both properties to stop staring, and he scurried away behind his little corner. My brother and I continued our conversation as it seemed he got the hint. I was wrong. I kept an eye out for him and that corner. I saw him again, this time just the top of his head and eyes as he concealed his body behind his house and leaned forward as far as he could. My blood ran cold. This guy, who I don't even know, and is three times my age, is so desperate to just look at me that he can't even stop even after being yelled at. I yelled again and he hid again not saying a word. I was trying to wrap up the conversation between me and my brother so I could shut my window and hide. Once again, I see him, just his head and eyes, staring. I scream this time and then slam my window. He cowered off, but he won't get the hint. I don't know what to do. I like keeping my blinds open during the day since I can keep the cacti in my room that need light. Not to mention, the lights in my room don't work, so I have to use sunlight anyway. I shouldn't have to change my routine because of a creep, but I don't think I can report him to the police because he's staying on his property. I don't know if I can legally record him if he's in his yard. I want to knock on his door and tell his wife, but my mom advised me against that. I don't think me giving him a stern talk will do anything other than fuel whatever fantasies he might have of me. It could be dangerous, too. This situation is starting to affect my mental health. I'll wake up in the middle of the night, convinced someone is right outside, looking at me. I can't even change my clothes in my own room anymore, because I feel like he's already caught a peek. Not too long after, he was outside shirtless, smoking a cigarette. He could tell I saw him. He scurried away and then came back. I grabbed my phone, opened up Snapchat and started recording. I just screamed at him and threatened to call the cops, and he argued back. I called my mom and I told her I was calling the cops. She told me she would come home and talk to me about it before we do. She was brief. My mom called me again before I left to my friends and allowed me to explain the situation further. I guess she thought I was outside when this happened, which is why she wasn't urgent. She's told me to stay home and to get the house ready for the police, and gave me the green light to call them. So I called the cops. An officer came over and I showed him from my room where the neighbor stands outside. Basically, he told me to get a curtain and that since he's on his property, he's technically allowed to stand and look in any direction he wants. And it's just unfortunate my window is easy to see into. He can't tell him not to face my house when he smokes outside. I ask the officer to suggest he smokes on the other side of his house or on the front porch. He said he would talk to him, but not to expect much to happen. I told the officer I felt it was an invasion of privacy and that it's been occurring for months, that I should be able to live in my room and not be watched. Basically, I guess he has the right to look into my room as long as he is in his yard, and I can't do anything about it legally unless there is solid evidence of intention. I also found out my mom shut off the cameras because it was blowing up her phone too much. If I had a recording of yesterday where he peeked around the corner, I could have proved intent. I guess I'm out of luck. Hey.
Hello, I am a married woman and my husband and I have two children, Isaac from my first marriage and Tiana with my now husband. I am very distraught right now because I've been seeing this woman almost everywhere I go. I have no idea if this is happening by coincidence. I'm trying to be calm as I tell you this. This whole situation started somewhere around May 2022, where me and Isaac were at the local park just doing our own thing. My son was just playing with some children at the monkey bars when I saw this woman approach me. She had red hair and her face seemed tear-stained. I became concerned as I thought she was crying. I proceeded to ask her what was wrong, if she was alright, but she kept staring at my son. The more she looked at him, the more she sobbed. Then, all of a sudden, she sprints to him, running, screaming Michael. She kept calling him that, and it freaked me out. I mean, she was running to my kid and calling him a different name. My son and the other child got scared off. I approached them before she did as I was faster than her. I then screamed at her to get lost, but she just stood there as I held my son. She seemed pretty enraged. She then muttered some things, but I could not hear her as she stomped away. The other child's father and I talked for a bit, and he also seemed alarmed by what happened. He predicted that she was probably a grieving mother, and that my son looked like the child she lost. I was still disturbed and took my son home. Since then, I've been afraid to take any of my children to any public areas despite my husband's reassurance. Skip to June 2nd, 2022, I get a call from my school stating that a woman who was a new volunteer for lunch duty kept saying to my son, hey Mikey Bear, and that she's been looking for him for years. They told me that another volunteer who'd been working with her reported this. I was scared as hell, and I acted immediately by signing my kids out for the day. When I called the school the next day, I was informed she was no longer there, so I became pretty freaked out. Skip to last week, July 13th, 2022. It was Tiana's fifth birthday, and we decided to host it at a park in my in-law's hometown. Everything went well, although I was paranoid. It was then, somewhere around 9pm, when we began tidying up, and as I looked at the many oak trees behind, I could have sworn I saw her. I screamed at the top of my lungs and started chasing after her, but she somehow got away. Ever since then, I have not seen her, but I feel like this is not the end of it. I decided to call my parents and the police. The school said they would give the woman's information to the police if they asked for it. The police were somewhat helpful. They were there from 6pm to 8pm. We told them all about the incident with the woman, and thankfully they were later able to get the information about her from the school. I know the information she gave the school could have been possibly fake, but that's still not confirmed yet. The police did say that they were going to interview the woman who was volunteering alongside her, as well as the children and teacher in my son's classroom. A police report has been filed though, and I've had some people say she could be associated with my deceased ex. My son does look awfully like his dad. I'm scared as hell right now. She could be a crazy ex or family member, but I've only known her through this situation. That's it. I don't fucking know. I was a very talkative child. I loved chatting and making friends in the park, in the mall, wherever I would go really. Every week we would go to various grocery stores to go and buy the stuff that we need. May it be cooking oil or baby powder. We always did shopping on a weekly basis. I always seemed to unexpectedly remember this vivid memory of one Sunday. It was in a grocery store about three kilometers away from home. I was a toddler then, so I was pretty helpless even though I knew how to speak short words by then. Mind you, this was in a grocery store in the middle of the day. A lot of people thought of me as extremely adorable, mostly because of my plump figure as a kid. I was holding my mom's hand and we were walking through the aisles. When she got all that we needed, we walked to the checkout. 
My mom was busy, so I took a brief look around and was observing the place. I was walking, smiling at people, waving at some kids. And then, this woman approached me. She was some sort of employee for a baby milk brand and was searching for some new talent that they could use in their upcoming commercial. She looked down on me and I immediately felt cold. She had the eeriest fake smile and wore pink violet clothes. She had a lavalier microphone on, but it was turned off. She was talking to my mom about maybe considering me as a baby milk model for their commercial. My mom politely said that she wasn't interested, but the woman did not take it lightly. All of a sudden, she grabbed on my arm and tugged on it like I was some sort of ragdoll. At this point, my heart was beating rapidly. Who is this woman? Why is she doing this? Why isn't anyone stopping her? These were the questions running through my mind as she heaved me aggressively. My mom was quick to respond and everything went slow. They were both pulling on my arms. My mom on the left and the woman on the right. The woman would just not give up. She pulled harder and it caused me intense pain on my right shoulder. I started crying. I was panicking on the inside. I was wondering if this woman would tear me to pieces. As a kid, this was all I knew to think. I will forever be grateful to my mother because of this. She screamed and called out to the people just watching, which alerted the security. The guard came and removed the woman's grasp from my arm. I felt relief as I hugged my mom tightly. The security guard escorted the girl to the employee's lounge while my mom filed a report to their office. We then met up with my aunt and dad and I was treated to some dim sum right after. So when I was little, I was involved in something called Safety City. It's basically a program for kids that teaches you about safety during fires and shows you what different things mean like stop signs and such. It's actually really fun for kids that age. After completing a task or answering a question right, you get a sticker or a badge and everyone got to wear police caps. Well, one afternoon after Safety City, I was outside playing with Chaco or something else a five-year-old would be doing alone on the driveway. A white van drove by slowly and stopped in front of our basketball hoop. A man and a woman, my parents' age probably, got out of the van and said hello to me. They started speaking to me like they'd known me since I was born. In fact, I think the lady said she remembered I was a very pretty baby and had a pretty shaped head, whatever that means. After answering some mundane questions they had for me, the lady told me she had puppies in the van. Of course my ears perked right up and I stood up and said, Really? And then the man chimed in, Yeah, would you like to pet them? Without another thought, I grabbed the lady's outstretched hand and followed her to the van. I really wanted a damn puppy. I was five, so I was very stupid. She slid the door open and helped me hop up into a seat and then slammed the door shut. There were no puppies. And I mean, I got up and searched the entire back seat and the seats behind me. They both had gotten into the van and ordered me to sit down. They started driving, and at this point, I began to panic. We had just talked about getting into strangers' vehicles in Safety City earlier that day, and I had wandered right into their trap. After driving for what seemed like an hour, but was actually probably a few minutes, we landed in front of my house again. They opened the van door and let me hop out. I ran to my mom and dad, who were standing on the driveway. I was sobbing and couldn't make out half of what they were saying to me. At this point, I noticed Officer Meathead standing on the opposite side of my dad. He was the teacher of my Safety City class. He explained to me that this was a test and I'd failed miserably. The two people in the van were actually two of my parents' good friends, who I just didn't remember. Long story short, this entire thing was a sick test to teach me to never get into cars with strangers. Ever. From that day on, I was always on guard for vans. Even if it was a neighbor that I knew very well, I basically gave them the fuck you sign when they drove by. 
and then I would run into the house. I will never forget my dad picking me up, almost in tears, saying to me, Sissy, you cannot ever get into a car with a stranger. If a stranger approaches you, you scream bloody murder for daddy, okay? It might be worth mentioning that I live in a really small town in Ohio where everyone knows everyone. So pretty much everyone's child went through this test if they took a safety city class. This is the first time something like this has ever happened and I can't get it out of my mind. I went grocery shopping with my half-sister today. Everything was normal until midway into shopping. I was in the end of the juice aisle and my half-sister needed to use the restroom. I looked up at her as she ran off to the bathroom and as I watched her go, I noticed this older man, probably late 30s, standing in line waiting to pay. He was looking at me directly. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought he was looking around because he was in a long line. I looked down into my cart and looked up again, and he was still staring at me. I didn't think much of it. I started pushing my cart to get one more thing while my sister was in the bathroom. I left the aisle, took a left, and passed him directly. We locked eyes, and I just gave him a half-second smile, kinda like, what the fuck are you looking at, dude? Before I turned into another aisle, I turned around to see if he was still looking, and to my surprise, he was walking toward me, still staring at me. I was confused because he was just in line to pay, so I turned into the aisle, becoming hyper aware and a bit suspicious. I'm in the new aisle, and I walk through. I turn once more around, and there he is. He's now in the same aisle, walking my way, staring at me still. He's far from me. But something is wrong. I said to myself, I think I have a stalker. I kept going. At this point, I was in a bit of fight or flight, trying to lose him. I take a left and keep walking. I turn around, and he's now out of the aisle, coming towards me again. I take another turn into the frozen ice cream aisle, and as I walked through it, I turned around, and lo and behold, he's right there, turning into the aisle, still following me. I stopped and stared at him like, what the fuck? My heart started to pound and I honestly felt so helpless and scared, even though there were people everywhere. I started walking really fast into another aisle and I found a spot to hide. I stood in front of water bottles for a few seconds and ran to the produce department where I could find a worker in case I saw him again. I called my sister and thank God she found me and she's safe too. Please tell me what the fuck that was. I hope to God he was gone and did not see what car I was driving when I left. To first start off with, I live in a little city in SoCal with my roommate, who happens to be my cousin. During the pandemic, however, I've been staying with my parents who live in a very small town in NorCal. Because of my time in SoCal, I really do not like staying in NorCal. I would rather live back in my apartment. The reason why I haven't done it is because my parents might think I will get very lonely there since everything is closed down and my roommate is not there as he's also with his parents. However, since I had to go back for a specific reason, my parents wanted me to take their dog, Mocha, so I wouldn't feel as lonely staying there. I loved her, so I didn't mind one bit. Mocha is a small Pomchi dog that loves to play around with me and is usually by my side for most of the time. She also loves to go on runs with me, so I occasionally do take her on jogs. On a Wednesday night, I decided to go running with her. Whenever I go on any runs, I go at night, because that's the time I'm most energetic. And all the times I went running at night, I never had any type of encounters or occurrences. I put Mocha on a leash and off we went. About 20 minutes into our run, I was running through a creek where there was a park next to it and a bunch of trees surrounding it. There were houses to the other side. The trail was pretty narrow 
and the street lamps were pretty dim, but still bright enough to see up ahead. As I'm running with music playing, my leash was tugged by Mocha. This usually happens when she wants to go to the bathroom, so I stopped to let her do her thing. But when I turned around, she was in her alert stance, looking straight behind, where we had just come from. I just assumed that she had heard a squirrel or any small animal, as she usually does this when she sees one. I was tugging her leash, telling her, Let's go. There's nothing there. She didn't oblige at first. She just kept looking behind us. It took me about four to five tugs before she finally came to me. I resumed playing my music, and we both went off running. I was almost out of the creek, and then I would meet a narrow sidewalk that was straight ahead. The trail only had to take a short turn. Maybe a minute or two later, Mocha took the leash again and went into her alert stance behind us. She did an aggressive bark and started growling. I stopped and was looking all around behind us. I was kind of freaked out because the trail had a couple of turns and curves. This meant that something was most likely following us. My first guess was a lost dog, which was unsettling because Mocha is tiny. If it was a big dog, it can easily overpower her. As I was looking around the dim area, for a split second, I got a black humanoid figure about 15 yards away from me, right behind a bush next to a tree. I immediately turned my eyes to the opposite direction and pretended that I did not see him, but boy was my heart pounding. I didn't see any figures or his face, I just saw the outline of his upper body. I didn't have any weapons on me as self-defense. If this guy's following me, my best solution is to run off without him trying to catch me. I tried to act cool and told Mocha, let's go. The trail was going to end. I just had to make a turn and it would be a straight sidewalk that was about 300 to 400 yards. There are fences on both sides of the sidewalk, so the only solution was to keep running forward. I went to jog right as I turned the corner. I made sure that I was out of view from the person. I went on a full sprint as quietly as I could. The sidewalk was ahead of me, so I made sure to just keep running. I kept looking behind me to see if I was really being followed. About 70 yards away, I saw a person come to view. they just come from the turn and then started to sprint as fast as they could toward me. As if I wasn't sprinting, I went even faster. I'd never sprinted so fast in my life. Looking back, I'm amazed how fast I ran. Mocha was keeping up with me. It was about a hundred yards of me sprinting, I looked back. The guy was still running behind me. He had a dark hoodie on, sweatpants, and appeared to be six foot tall. He was still the same distance that I noticed him, which mean that he was pretty fast as well. The sidewalk was going to end in about a hundred yards, and it would lead to a neighborhood. I could lose him there. I was slowly getting out of breath. My adrenaline was beginning to die down. I kept sprinting, hoping I wouldn't get tired too quickly. 100 yards of me sprinting, I finally made it to the neighborhood out of breath. The neighborhood was pretty broad, so if I were to keep running, the person would have spotted me right away. And at the pace he was running, it didn't seem like a good idea. My best solution was to hide. I went straight to a random house and jumped over to their backyard, where I would be kept hidden behind the fence. I basically threw Mocha over and then jumped over myself. We were both panting, but I tried to keep quiet as I heard footsteps coming by. The guy had finished the trail and was now in the neighborhood. He stopped running and I heard him panting. I was hearing him mutter as he was out of breath. He kept saying, fuck, what the fuck? I was holding Mocha, scratching her so she wouldn't bark or growl. About five minutes later, I heard footsteps walking away, and then slowly fading. I waited about ten minutes in complete silence. To be sure he wasn't close by, I popped my head around the fence to look, and I was all alone now. I got Mocha and went to the opposite direction from where I heard the guy go. Even though I was tired, I tried to jog so I could get home sooner. I kept looking around me. I was very paranoid that the guy would be there somewhere. I made it back home with no problem, and I gotta thank Mocha for pretty much telling me that someone was behind and stalking us. 
I don't know how long he was following us for or what he was planning on doing. I just hope he didn't get a clear glimpse of my face because I don't want to run into him again. My boyfriend and I recently decided that we wanted to take the new tent we bought on its first trip. The tent was the one that hooks up to your car to provide more storage space. We were excited to try it out. We had planned a kayaking trip the next day at a kayak rental shop. It was supposed to be a nice, inexpensive, outdoorsy weekend getaway. We tend to book things last minute, so all the state parks and professional campgrounds were full. This led us to a website that's essentially an Airbnb for campsites. The place we chose was a 100-acre property just 20 minutes south of the kayak shop. Of all the sites in the area, it was described as having working bathrooms, showers, it allowed for campfires, and all the sites were car accessible. This site was also the most reviewed in the area, with three 5 out of 5 star reviews. The area was very rural so we did not think much about the low number of reviews for any of the campsites. The renter was Mary, who only ever texted us updates, but she seemed sweet. We start our two-hour drive a bit later than anticipated, which put us behind the 11 a.m. time we'd originally informed the host, but we tried to keep her updated with the new schedule. She just told us to let her know when we arrived at the address she sent us. We arrived to the address and are greeted with the barn from the pictures, it had string lights lit up all over it, seemed fairly new, and just gave a nice feel to it. We sit in the car for a minute and struggled with cell service to text the host to let her know we had arrived. Ten minutes after our text sends, a sweaty man who appears to be in his 60s pulls up in an ATV. He lets us know he's the father-in-law to Mary and that she's busy taking care of the seasonal harvest and sent him instead. He lets us know we can take the car anywhere on the property and offers to show us around in the ATV. My boyfriend, visibly uncomfortable, declines the offer and asks a few more questions about the woods and how far into them we were allowed to take the car. Anywhere. We can go anywhere. And the ATV man even offers to help pull my car out if it gets stuck. We ask one final question about cell service. And he jokes that if we are from around here, we will understand that reception works better on one side of the barn than the other. I am from around here, and I thought it was funny, but once he said that, I realized he didn't have any ounce of an accent for here, like he should. Eventually he leaves, and we begin exploring the property on foot. The barn has all the lights on in the middle of the day, and it looks nice and maintained. It's insulated and has a working kitchen. The only warning we got was not to drink the water. It seemed like a place that would host small 50 guest weddings. We walked past a shed out behind the barn that gets to the trails that ran through the woods. After going through a hike that my car would never have survived, we decided it might be best to just camp by a small creek. We choose a spot on the side opposite the barn. We were still within walking distance but we used my car as a buffer to feel a bit more isolated. We choose our spot and then go into the main town to eat and walk around. We message Mary about the fire policy, and she tells us they will deliver a fire ring to the barn for us to take to camp. We arrive back at the barn about an hour and a half from nighttime. We drive by the barn and the lights have been turned off. We assumed it was on a timer as to not waste energy or money, we also noticed the fire ring had not yet been delivered. We start the grueling 30 minute setup in the sticky heat and reward ourselves with a sit in the air conditioned car. We notice it looks like it's about to rain, so my boyfriend and I pull out a card game and wait for it to pass in the car. It only lasted about 10 minutes, but it is starting to get to sunset. The tent held up nicely, so we felt okay leaving it for a second. Needing to use the bathroom, we start walking to the barn. As we cross the creek, we hear what sounds to be like someone in the shed behind the barn. They sound like they're moving things around. A bit unsettling, but I tell my boyfriend that maybe they used equipment today 
and it's just sitting in there, making the cracking cool-off noise that equipment sometimes does. We get to the barn, and the lights are off still, but the fire ring is there. We go in and check to make sure the power is off, and it's not just the lights outside. None of the light switches will work, so we assume the power's cut. Again, maybe it's just on a timer, so no worries. We step out of the barn and get ten feet away, and we hear a hum in the distance to the opposite side of the shed. The power to the barn is restored. Maybe it's the weather. We change direction to use the bathroom. As soon as we step inside, the power cuts and the hum stops. I start to get a weird feeling, and I can tell my boyfriend has it too. I look to my boyfriend and say, maybe they're just watching us. I immediately follow up with, no, that's a lot worse. We walk back outside and the lights turn on. My boyfriend says that we need to leave, and I have the same gut-wrenching primal fear. We put the ring back by the barn since we'd moved it ten feet, and the barn lights start flickering. We briskly walk back to the car. The 30-minute setup was torn down in five, and we jump in the car and lock it. I managed to get my car going, thanking God that the rain did not get my car stuck. We start toward the driveway, and just as we made it to the road, my boyfriend looks back and sees a man standing by the shed, watching us. As soon as my car pulls off onto the road, we get a text from Mary, letting us know that the fire rink is by the barn. She also informs us that we're welcome to stay in the barn if the rain had messed up our camping experience. We arrived at a nice hotel, willing to splurge for safety. At this point it's 10pm at the earliest. A sweet older lady checks us in. Desperate for validation, and just comfort from anyone, we tell her what had just happened to us at the campsite. She looks shocked. She asks if we had seen the news lately which we both respond that we'd not. The lady tells us that couples in the state have been going missing. All of them had gone camping. Three couples were truly missing, and one was recently found on the side of a freeway, slashed nearly to death. They are, to the time of telling this, still recovering in the hospital. We couldn't find many articles about where in the state, but the look on the lady's face suggested it was near us. We get to our room and text Mary back to tell her that we're not staying anymore. We got a reply back saying, thank you for staying with us. We lock the door to our hotel room and I break down into tears. I will not forget that feeling I got at the bar, the primal fight or flight feeling, and the feeling of being watched. I feel it in my throat just telling this. I never want to experience that again. I'm something of an avid cyclist, and I have been all my life. It's my preferred method of transportation. I also live in a town that's famous for its ever-expanding network of pedestrian and bike paths. We've even won some awards for them over the years. I'm also an Iraq veteran. This may explain something that happens later. The summers where I live tend to be quite humid, but otherwise pleasant. So one gorgeous August day off of work, I decide to go for a ride. I didn't have a specific end destination in mind, but I got this idea to ride along a southbound trail that I don't go through very often. There are enough traffic lights along that section that it should have been a relatively safe ride, and it goes along the border of a rather popular city park. I figured there'd be plenty of people there, especially on such a nice day. Well, I was kinda sorta right about that. About twenty or so minutes into my otherwise smooth pleasure ride, I come up to a couple of bends in the bath not long before the park. There are a few people jogging or walking their dogs, one or two people walking by themselves. So far nothing unusual. The trails are paved and divided into two lanes, just like a regular road, where you're supposed to stay in the right-hand lane. Not far ahead, I noticed a dark-haired dude walking in the wrong lane. 
It's not illegal to do so, but it can be dangerous. I noticed that he seemed to have no regard whatsoever for others walking in the proper direction and almost bumped into a few of them without a thought. But I also saw that he was wearing what looked like an old navy blue puffy jacket on a humid day in fucking August. Call it situational awareness or what have you. But no one in their right mind wears a fall jacket in the summertime south of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm about 30 or so feet away from the guy when he finally sees me, and my stomach drops as I swear to y'all on my life. He pauses mid-step, and then his face melts into a downward-facing, jokerish smile. Then he opens his jacket, revealing a sweaty gray shirt underneath as he reached inside of it for something I couldn't see. And that's when something in my head says, Fuck no. I don't know what some of you listening to this might do if faced with something like this, but I got this batshit insane idea. Instead of turning around, instead of screaming or stopping, I pedaled faster. Without a second thought, I just spun the pedals as hard as I could with the intention of charging him very similar to a medieval jouster. Dangerous moments like these may only last for a few seconds in reality, but I swear, I felt like I was building up speed and barreling toward this guy for a good minute or two. I don't know why my brain decided that charging him head on was the thing to do, and maybe it could have just easily have gotten me hurt or killed, but I didn't care. I can point out Mosul, Baghdad, and Fallujah on an unlabeled map of the Middle East. I was scared, of course, but something I haven't felt since I've been over there drove me to do something. He sees me speeding up and hunkering down, but he isn't getting out of the way. Only within seconds, maybe less than two feet shy of slamming into him, does he realize what's about to happen. Then he dives to the left. I don't stop. I don't look back. I don't even think about it. I just fucking go and keep going. I later happen to pass a female jogger or two coming the opposite direction. I give them a heads up about the guy and they promptly turn around. I sought a different route home that day and locked all my doors when I got home. I haven't been on that stretch of trail since. I didn't think to tell the police at the time, given that I wasn't actually harmed and that just acting scary isn't a crime in of itself, but maybe I should have. But about a month later, a local news story crossed my Facebook feed. The fifth rotting body in less than two years was just discovered near that same area of the trail, near a creek. Cops said that they weren't exactly sure how a homeless man had died, but that it didn't look like a natural death. All of the victims were known vagabonds, people that nobody would otherwise give a shit about. I'm not saying that I definitely bull rushed a serial killer, but to this day, I often ponder that possibility. This particular accident happened almost two decades ago, when I was around 10. I think I should stress before this that my parents really aren't pranksters. Even in regular social situations where everyone's joking around and messing with each other, they usually get straight to the point. I have no reason at all to believe that they were lying. It was the camping trip my dad had been looking forward to every day since the snow melted into springtime. He'd requested a week off in work late in June so that we could all go up to his favorite chunk of forest. They stayed park about an hour's drive away from where we live, and do this thing as a family. We set up on campground, us two kids in one tent, and my parents in another. The first day goes great, there's a lot of splashing around in the river, hiking, doing fun family stuff. My brother and I rarely get along. This was one of those rare moments that we enjoyed each other's company. Anyway, the sun starts to set casting everything in gold, and the night finds the four of us sitting around the campfire making s'mores. I remember getting really spooked by all the noises in the distance, and my parents were constantly telling me to calm down. They reminded me that there were other campers here. It's a state park after all, 
and this was the biggest time of year for campers. Also, there were no doubt lots of small furry animals like raccoons or squirrels or whatever running about out there in the darkness. This eases my nerves. For a moment or so, I could have sworn I heard a particular sound nearby though. I knew that sound from all the games of hide and seek I'd play so often as a kid. It was the sound of someone trying to hold their breath but they were too excited to fall completely silent, but only for a moment, and then it was gone. The real event happened the next night. All four of us were in our tents, my brother fast asleep in the sleeping bag right next to me. I have a lot of body warmth, so I had unzipped my bag and was just laying there, staring into the darkness. I was trying to fall asleep to the soft lullaby of Mother Nature and whatnot but it really wasn't coming to me. I reach over and, as delicately as possible, slip my brother's old flip phone out of his pillowcase, where I knew he liked to keep it safe. I don't remember the exact time, but it was very early into the morning. Back when I was that age, I rarely stayed up after 10. Nearby, I heard a zipping sound. It was probably coming from my parents' tent, I figured. Thinking that somehow my dad knew I was awake, I quickly slipped the phone back into the pillowcase and fell back into the sleep position. Muffled footsteps, the crunching of gravel, the snapping of twigs, walked closer toward our tent, then coming to a stop right outside the tent flap. Dad? I asked for a moment, whispering so as not to wake up my brother. Hey, I'm going to the bathroom. Do you need to go too? The person outside the tent asked, remembering that the bathrooms, that big building in the middle of the campgrounds that held the showers and the toilet stalls, were in the direction that my dad was walking in. I realized that I did have to pee. Yeah, give me a second, I replied quietly. So I got up, stepped gingerly over my older brother, slipped on my flip-flops, and exited the tent. Sure enough, some ways down the gravel pathway that led to the bright light of the bathrooms was the big, bulky silhouette of my father. He was too far and the light too glaring to see him clearly. I walked after him, shivering slightly in the wind. Dad, wait! I called in a hushed tone, picking up speed to catch up. The bulky silhouette waved a hand toward me and headed into a different angle of the trees than we had come. This confused me, and I stopped. Hey, come on, this is a shortcut, my dad said. I realized I'd actually never seen his face the entire night, so I got a bit nervous. That's a stupid shortcut, I'm just going this way, I said, and headed toward the actual direction of the campsite. The man got impatient. Get over here right now, we're going this way, you little shit. My dad had never sworn to me before, so that's when the alarm bells really started ringing. I turned and ran as fast as I could, finding our camping spot and practically diving into my parents' tent. To my surprise, I found my parents playing cards under the light of a tiny electronic lamp. I asked my dad if he'd gone to the bathrooms at all that night, to which he replied no. My parents had woken up a few minutes beforehand by what they thought was a raccoon snooping around where our trash bag was, outside the tents. That's when they had decided they couldn't really sleep, so they should play cards. I told them about what had happened, and my parents got out of the tent and searched the area, but they didn't find anyone. To this day, they can't decide if there was actually a man trying to lure me into the dark forest, or if I'd just had a bad dream or something. I was a pretty imaginative kid back then, and, knowing how my brain is better now, even I don't trust myself entirely to know what's the truth or what's just my overactive imagination and crumbling sanity. One time while I was driving, I ran a red light, swearing up and down that I'd been told for the last 18 years that green is stop and red is go. I remember going to the store wearing white socks and flip-flops because my brother told me as I was walking out the door that I looked like an idiot wearing white socks with flip-flops. But as I was standing in the checkout line, I realized I didn't have socks on anymore. 
Another time, I triple-checked to make sure my car was locked in the parking lot, and I came back to find my car unlocked and my keys disappeared from my pocket. They were sitting in the driver's seat. Things like that happen sometimes. So for a bit of background, I immigrated to a small town in the northeastern US a bit over a year ago from Australia. There are a handful of people of my nationality here, but we're pretty few and far between. I work in a job where I have a little bit of profile in the community. That's somewhat relevant. A few weeks ago at work, I see this message in my Facebook, Other Inbox. The one where messages from people I'm not friends with go to. It's obviously from a dude in the area, based on the limited information I can read from his profile. So I figured it was some random person who'd seen my work, found me on Facebook, and wanted to drop me a line. It happens every now and then, so I wasn't terribly phased. It read, Hello, how are you? I've been to Australia three times, for a total of a year and a half. I lived in Sydney and Melbourne. I went back in 93 and 2014. Please put in a friend request. I couldn't figure out how to do it from my end, as there was no option. I hope to hear from you. Thanks, Phil. Later that night, I get home from work and I'm having dinner with my girlfriend, who owns a bar I work weekends at. She starts dying laughing and says, Oh shit, I forgot to tell you, and you're going to kill me. My first customer today wanders in, and already I can tell he's a bit weird. He asks for a beer, and I give him one and he asks me what age ranges of women come in here. I tell him like 25 plus. He says, that's my age range, I'm 44, and keeps on rambling to her. Somehow he gets onto the topic of Australia, and he's been there a few times. She says, oh, my boyfriend is Australian actually, and I cut her dead off with, wait, is his name Phil? She falls about laughing and says, yeah. I yelled, fuck me. Apparently he spent a good hour showing off his knowledge of my country slang terms and geographical tidbits before asking where I lived, then asking my full name and whether I worked there. He told her he loves people my nationality and that he's a state certified guide so he could take me out canoeing or hiking or whatever. Yeah, like I'm gonna fucking go into the woods with a strange guy who tracked me down over Facebook just because I'm from a country he loves. He goes back into the bar two nights later, a Friday night, and my girlfriend texts me, saying that he asked her whether he got my full name right because he sent me a Facebook message and I never responded. He then proceeded to repeat his repertoire of my country's lingo and told a handful of off-color jokes, offending at least one female bar patron. He said that he'd be back in the following night to see me, a snowstorm that weekend meant I dodged the bullet that Saturday night, but the following weekend, he walked in the door of the bar as I was seating a couple of customers. I gave him a token, how's it going, and he launches straight into, are you the Australian guy? Fuck. Well, I'm one of them, I said. He perches himself right on a bar stool in front of me, orders a beer, and proceeds to talk non-fucking stop. He rattles off all the places he's been to, countless random trivia facts about my country, and all of the places he wants to visit. He wasn't just intense and creepy. He had absolutely no situational awareness. It was a busy Saturday night in the bar. I'm the only bartender, and I'm running around the room serving people. But he wouldn't stop talking at me the entire time. Thankfully, the girl sitting next to him was also not from around here, and he got distracted talking to her about, taking her out into the woods. Eventually he asked for his check, pointedly showed me the tip line, and asked me if that was enough. And then he left. Although initially my girlfriend had thought it was funny that he was bent on meeting me, she quickly became creeped out by his behavior too. I managed to avoid him for a week or two after that, until one Friday afternoon, the girlfriend and I were having a quick lunch at the pub before I went into the office. We sat at a table next to the main bar, and who should cut his conversation with the bartender in mid-sentence? 
turn around and stride over, your friendly neighborhood creep. I've got something to show you, he said to me as he rummaged in the pocket of his jeans, before pulling out a large handful of loose change. My country's change. Uh, yeah, I've seen Australia's currency before. Do you actually carry that around with you all the time? I love Australia, he said. Yeah, that much is fucking evident. He again gave me his shtick about how he wants to visit various cities, the third time I've heard it now, and again, failed to recognize my half-turned-away, ignoring him body language. Mercifully, the bartender came over to take our order, and Phil left to pay his tab. The bartender brought over a slip of paper Phil had written his information on, in case anyone was interested in going out into the woods for outdoors activities. It was like something they'd find in Ted Bundy's personal effects. The handwriting and general layout of this note made me immediately and genuinely question this guy's grip on reality. He leaves, and I breathe an audible sigh of relief. We start talking to the bartender about our other weird interactions with the guy, and of course who should return quietly, probably hearing everything in the process, because he left his coat on the coat rack. Christ. He showed up at the bar again later that night, while I was in the office. He told my girlfriend that he's also a scoutmaster. Ugh. Do you want to know the best day of my life? He asked her. He said he was asked to speak to an audience of students at an all-girls private school one time, when he was in Australia in his thirties. Afterwards, he said, he slept with one of the seniors, somehow. I didn't ask further details. I haven't seen him since, thankfully, but he cropped up elsewhere in what I hope is small world coincidence. I'd relayed this story to a co-worker last Friday after she told me a similar story about being harassed by a weirdo she talked to on a dating website. Today, she says, I think the stalker outdoor guide who's following you around contacted me on a dating site. Sure enough, I look at his profile, and it's him. No question. She takes a bunch of screenshots of what I can gather is his about me section and texts them over to me. They are the ramblings of a madman. I'm a 21-year-old guy. This happened to me back when I was in high school, about five years ago. It was my senior year. Classes were winding down and teachers were finding less to talk about, as we were so excited to get out of there. This one teacher I had was super quirky, kind of weird but cool to me, as he always had interesting experiences to share. He and my group of friends in the class became acquainted, among the other students who wouldn't listen to him when he attempted to speak about his past shenanigans. One day he brought up this, oasis as he called it, the place in the woods where he would visit when he was young. It was a clearing deep within the trees with dunes and a small beach, not too far from where we were going to school. We, of course, didn't believe him, so we showed us on Google Maps. Our naive selves thought that after school, we could attempt to reach this place, entering from a backyard closest to the clearing. We should have known that 40-something years later, the layout of the place would have changed. Come the end of the day, I gather up three of my closest friends. We all agree on the plan of using Google Maps as our GPS. After convincing one of our moms to drop us off with a lie of hanging at a friend's place, we made our way to the edge of the forest. God, I wish we called it quits then. We started out alright, I guess making our way closer by climbing through the hordes of bushes and weeds. It was probably the most run-down, gross, dumped-on parts of the forest, with broken car parts and trash everywhere. Eventually, as we get closer to the supposed clearing, we hear a dog viciously bark in the distance. My alarms went off. What was a dog doing in the middle of the damn woods? It was fairly residential, so no hunting but also no trails or any other reason to be out there. My friends were a mix of angry at me for suggesting this, 
and extremely anxious about how we're going to get through it. At this point, we just wanted to make it to the sandy beach part of the woods, which seemed so close judging by our distance on the maps. The closer we got, the louder the barking became. At this point, we weren't saying much to each other as I led. We were literally up Shit's Creek with nowhere to go. The barking seemed like it was coming from everywhere. I could see a dirt clearing ahead, so I just told everybody to make a break for it. At least in the open, we could see what was coming at us. This was not the clearing we were hoping for, and one I could not find on the map when I tried to look for it later. Off in the distance was a medium-sized makeshift building. It appeared to be made of plywood, painted gray and black. Above the door hung a giant animal skull with horns. I felt a pit in my stomach because I immediately knew this was the source of the barking, being as it was at its loudest. After managing to snap a picture, I stood there frozen, unsure of what to do next. I came back to my senses when I hear a deep and angry voice shout, Hey, what the hell are you doing? From somewhere close by the building. I had officially had enough of this situation. I'd gotten all my friends into this mess, so I felt responsible for their safety. I told everyone we're just going to have to bite the bullet and run blind through the woods. It could have been my mind playing tricks, but I swear, it felt like the dog was chasing us. Almost like someone let it loose. After kicking through dense wilderness and trees, we were so scraped up and bloody by the time we got far enough away that we felt safe. Huddled together and practically crying, I called my mother and told her the mess we were in. I gave her the street closest to the side of the woods we were on, and she gladly came and picked us up. She said when she saw us on the side of the road, it looked like we'd been through hell and back. After that day, we barely spoke about it. We didn't even tell the teacher who started the whole thing in fear of somehow getting him in trouble. Gather around folks as I recall to you the details of the most what the fuck moment of my life. This takes place sometime around the summer of 2009 to 2010. I'm a woman and I was 14 to 15 years old at the time. My family wasn't really financially well off, but my dad managed to pull together a family camping trip to Savannah, Georgia. Though Savannah wasn't home to the most beautiful of beaches, it was a beach that held a lot of sentimental value. I remember camping on Tybee Island many times as a kid. I was over the moon excited to be going back for the first time since I was a much smaller kid, and this time. I was getting to bring my best friend. The weekend had never looked more enticing. The trip started off as normal. We got to the campsite and my dad started to set up his tent. My oldest brother and his girlfriend were just hanging out. My other older brother was busy exploring the site. My friend and I were hanging out on the picnic table near the rather small tent. After everything was set up, we were all just hanging out and relaxing as it was already getting late by this time. It might be worth mentioning that I come from a 420 friendly household, so please refrain from judgment. Anyway, we were just chilling and smoking a small joint when our camp neighbor pops out from his tent. He must have smelled our ganja so he came over and introduced himself. His name was Dan, he's in his mid-fifties and around six foot, give or take an inch or two. About ear length greasy looking grey hair, he kind of made my skin crawl a bit, but hey. So Dan comes up and introduces himself and asks to smoke with us. My friend and I didn't partake in the group chat as we really didn't give a shit like most teenage girls wouldn't. So we just conversed amongst ourselves close by so we could still smoke, but far enough that we wouldn't have to engage in conversation with Dan. I wasn't worried as I had my two older brothers and my dad there to protect us. And one thing about the middle oldest brother is that he was a wild little shit who would probably kill the guy if he tried anything funny. But regardless, I was still aware of how much he gave me the heebie-jeebies. However, he didn't try anything, so that was cool. 
He just played guitar with my dad and my oldest brother until we all decided to crash. That night my friend and I decided to sleep on the picnic table. The tent with my dad felt too small and we felt too cool to share one with him. One of my brothers was already sleeping in the car and my eldest brother took off with his girlfriend to go sleep on the beach. So we decided fuck it, let's sleep on the table. Bad idea. We spent the whole night getting eaten by mosquitoes and feeling like we were being watched. It was terrible. 10 out of 10 I would not recommend. We slept in the car for the rest of the trip. The next morning, Dan popped up on us again as we were smoking a morning bowl while readying ourselves to go get breakfast. My dad, being the total gent that he is, invites Dan to come along. At this point, he seemed normal enough. Stinky, but nice enough. He never said anything weird to me or my friend, but I could just feel something off about him. But again, I felt safe with my brothers and my dad. I felt like just the appearance of my dad would be enough to make him steer clear of us. My dad's not too tall, but he is fit, covered in tattoos, with long hair, and several facial piercings. Total metalhead, and despite his big heart, he had the male equivalent of a resting bitch face. So, breakfast started off as normal. We're all baked and giggling, enjoying our scrumptious ass breakfast, when all of a sudden, Dan pipes up. He starts talking about the show, Hannah Montana. We all exchange glances like, is this grown man really raving about a tween television series? So we all sit back and listen. Dan goes on about how beautiful Miley Cyrus is, how much he hates the character Oliver, and how cool the character Lily was. We're all looking like, what the fuck, when the real fucking weird thing gets thrown out there. This guy, this poor, delusional man, starts telling us that he's in a relationship with Miley, that when she has a love interest in the show, it's really just a subliminal message that she's sending to him, that her lyrics and her music are for him. We obviously didn't question it, because we're all pretty clear that this guy is off his rocker, so what would be the point? So we all just nod our heads and hurry up on finishing our breakfast. Nobody even had to say what we were all thinking. So we just tried to kind of shrug him off if he approached us again. We all kind of caught on to how weird he was. And everyone just kind of steered clear of him from then on. Later that day, after we've digested our food a bit and relaxed and smoked, all that good stuff, we all decided to hit the beach. The part we went to was near a pier and a bunch of shops. So my friend and I decided to wander around a bit and get a bit of time away from all that testosterone. We roam the shops a bit and pick out some cute necklaces in the works. We then decide to head over to the pier. Now, the entrance of the pier had this little gazebo type shit with tables and drink machines and stuff. So my friend and I decided we were going to plant our little tired asses there and cool off a bit. So, we're chilling there talking about normal teen shit, when I spot Dan sitting just a couple of tables behind ours. My friend was sitting with her back towards him, so I quietly let her know that Dan was there watching us and that we should get out of there. So we get up and start heading toward the beach. We get off the pier and make it to the beach. We think we're in the clear. We hadn't seen him get up after us, but of course we were wrong. Not long after entering the beach part of the area, we peep that he's walking behind us. He's not too close, but close enough that it's blatantly obvious that he's indeed following us. So we silently come up with a plan in case he got a hold of us. We agreed that we would jump in if he tried anything. We were two small teen girls, but my friend was a crazy little Gemini who's also been attending kickboxing classes regularly for years. The girl could roundhouse kick the shit out of him, and he would 100% not expect it. So she made me feel brave and unafraid. The best kind of friend to have in a situation like this. However, as unafraid as I may have been, I still knew our best shot would be finding either one of my brothers or my dad. Fortunately for us, we saw my brother and his girlfriend relaxing on the beach not too far ahead, so we hurried up on them and Dan veered off somewhere else. 
Once we were sure he was gone, we started telling my brother about Dan following us. He was clearly bothered, but just told us to stay near and keep an eye out for him, to let him know if he says anything weird. And that was that. No idea if he wanted to snatch us up or simply just follow us around. I don't recall seeing Dan again that night, or on our last day there. His gear was gone by morning, and we all breathed a sigh of relief. Because let's be real. However sad it may be that he was so very clearly mentally ill, Dan was fucking weird and we were all pretty stoked to spend our last day without him. Our last day was great. We all had a blast and Dan never came back. So we packed up and waved goodbye to Savannah as we laughed and discussed all the crazy shit Dan had said on that trip. We could all agree that this seemingly nice and normal middle-aged man had given us a trip to remember. But wait, there's more. So after about a week or so of being home, my dad's watching the news when, guess who pops up on the screen? You guessed it. Headlined, Miley Cyrus Stalker arrested in Savannah, Georgia after trying to gain access to studio. Was some shit along those lines. But it was 100% him. No mistaking as they said his real name. And they listed our vacation weekend in Savannah as the time and place of his arrest. And of course... The picture solidified any prior doubts. It was him. So during that weekend, when he wasn't with us, he was actively stalking Miley Cyrus and was arrested for trying to get into that studio or wherever she was filming at. And that's why he wasn't there at the last day. So we decided, screw it. Let's Google this guy. Turns out this wasn't the first time he'd been arrested for stalking her. Dan had been arrested in a couple different states as he'd been following her around the country. He genuinely believed that they were in love. We found a video of him on YouTube being interviewed by some news guy. Dan was talking about how he was there to see Miley and that he was going to ask her to marry him. He looked so jittery and excited, like someone who was truly excited to propose to the love of their life would be. I think that's part of what weirded me out the most. He really and truly believed it with all his heart. And that, my friends, is terrifying to say the least. So there you have it. The story of my camping trip with the official Miley Cyrus stalker. As a last thought, I'll leave you with this. I kept wondering why Dan was drawn to my friend and I. And recently as I relayed this story to a friend, something dawned on me. Hannah Montana, or Miley, on the show was a brunette, and her best friend Lily was blonde. I was brunette, and my friend was blonde, so what if he saw us and had some weird thought of us being like them, or some shit like that? I don't know. It could be a stretch, but my mind was blown when I thought about it. Anyway, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed my story. It's one I will always enjoy telling, because it's just so, what the fuck, you know? My friend and I are still really close, and it's something that gets brought up at least once or twice a year with her or my family. A memory to last a lifetime for all involved. This happened about 10 years ago. Back then, I was really into dating websites, before the app days, before any kind of safety was in place. I would do quite well on these sites. I matched with people who were using the dating sites for the same reason I was. If you get me, we were looking for the same thing. I liked life. I was riding on my own confidence, daring myself to go bigger and bigger with these wild meetups. I was surprised one day to get matched with a 19-year-old. Her first message said, Give me your email address. I was fine with the direct approach, so I sent it straight over to her. You sound fun. I want to hang out with you. I couldn't believe my luck. I smiled and said to myself, You can do that today if you want, honey. I'm in good shape. I decided to reply with, Sounds great, but why don't we exchange photos before we meet? I sent the best photo of myself I could, slightly fraudulent as it was a couple of years old, but hey, 
I bet I wasn't the only one on that site to do that. Shortly after, I received a photo back. She was hot. I punched the air. Life was sweet. She had a pretty sweet tan and a cute pouty look on her face. I was into it. It was a home run. We were both really into meeting up, so we set up a date. Things moved quickly. She would send emails like, I don't want to go very far. I only have a moped. It would be sweet if you drove to come get me. This was kind of annoying as I wanted to avoid driving so I could drink, but since she was pretty hot, I guess I could just get loaded when I got home later. I decided I'd take her out to karaoke and dinner, and then, if there was a chance, drive somewhere secluded with her. And, uh, well, yeah. The day of the date arrived, and we planned on meeting at a home improvement store's car park at 6. That's kind of weird, but okay. I got myself looking good and brought protection. I was sure that I was going to have a great night. I just hoped the car would be big enough. Then my brother said he had to use our shared car. This was such a pain in the ass, as I would have to take our older, shittier van-looking car. There went my chances. I told her I'd be in a white minivan. Then my brother, as if he was some kind of saint, told me that he didn't need to use the sedan anymore. Thanks bro, you're a lifesaver, I thought. The sedan was way more cooler looking and roomy. The game was back on. I had a great feeling about the night ahead. Things were going my way. I was set to arrive at the home improvement store about five minutes ahead of the arranged meeting time. I thought I would drive around the parking lot to see if she was early too. I was about to turn into the car park when I got an email from her saying, Are you here yet? I replied with, I'll be there soon. I couldn't see in the car park, so I didn't understand why she was asking me if I was there yet. Then I saw a woman about ten meters up ahead. I actually shuddered because this seemed all wrong. She didn't mention anything about bringing a friend. This was beginning to look a little sinister. I saw her sat in a minivan's passenger seat, chatting to some guy in the driver's seat. I drove a little away from the van and parked up. I pulled my hat down over my face. I wanted to see what would happen when I messaged her next. She got out of the minivan and spoke to someone in the car parked next to it. Then two other men came over and spoke to her. This really sent some chills up my spine. It was so crazy. What were her plans for me? Extortion? Blackmail? She emailed me. Well, are you close? I replied with, Ah, I got a stomachache. I'm in the bathroom. A moment or two after I sent it, I saw a couple of men jump out the minivan and walk into the home improvement store. They were probably going to check the bathrooms. Where are you? She replied. I stopped off at a convenience store nearby. She must have called the men back because in a matter of moments they were all in the van and the car again. They left and headed the way I came. I drove in the opposite direction as fast as I could. I sent her a message saying that I was too sick to meet up, and I never heard from her again. I have learned since not to give out personal information, and always make sure the meeting place is somewhere neutral with lots of people nearby. Don't bring too many personal possessions and items of ID, and if something doesn't feel right, always consult the police. This only happened a few days ago. Recently I've been somewhat overindulging on the dating apps. I'm usually pretty bummed if I don't get to go on three dates a week. On the day in question, I had a really great date with this girl, so we decided on checking into a hotel together. She was just okay looking, but her personality made up for it, so I thought I'd give her a shot. I felt pretty great, lucky even. So we get into bed together and we chatted for a while. Then I quickly realized there was something off about her. While we were on the date, she was smiling, laughing, and often leading the conversation. 
but in the hotel room, she stared at me in the dark with eyes filled with hate. Her scowl was terrifying. She didn't speak at all. It was as if she had a complete change in a matter of moments. Did I say something to upset you? I asked. Oh no, not at all. She smiled, and then her face returned to that frightening scowl. This is bad, I thought. But I'd already paid for the hotel, so I thought, you know. I went to take a shower first. The shower room was fitted with frosted glass, so you could see the bedroom from in there. I was in the shower, and I glanced around and landed on the window. I saw that she was pressed up against the glass. I couldn't bring myself to look away. I was frozen in place while the hot water cascaded over me. What the hell was she doing? This isn't normal. Even though the water was warm, my skin was cold. I hated this situation. Something was incredibly wrong here. Only when I noticed something else in the room was I able to avert my eyes from her stare. There was a shadow stood beside the bed. Someone else was now in the room. I saw my date move over and stand next to the shadow. They looked as if they were in conversation with each other. What do I do? I asked myself. I couldn't come to any conclusions. The world was spinning around and around in my head. Panic had its icy fingers around my heart. I saw the two shadows turn and face my direction. As if a light was turned on or a bell was rung, I heard the following words in my head. Leave the room now. I had little other choice. I jumped out of the shower and just ran as fast as I could. I didn't even get a look at the other person in the room. And to my utter disbelief, I managed to get past them to get out of the room. I was running for my life. I was completely naked and must have looked like a madman but I didn't care. I was certain that I had just escaped death. I ran down to the front desk, and honestly, I can't even remember what I said or how I explained things. The adrenaline had taken over. I do remember later being escorted back to the room to see if I could retrieve my clothes. I was given absolute assurance that no one was in the room. This taught me that it can be terrifying to be alone in the room with a complete stranger. I take better care online now. I shudder to think about what might have happened to me. I can almost see my missing persons poster when I think back to that time. I'm a 35-year-old man. This is a really weird and mysterious thing that happened to me. A while ago, I downloaded a dating app even though I was married. I wanted to see if other women were interested in me, and I wanted to see if any of them would fall for me. I don't know. I guess that when I was young, I didn't really play around as much as I could have. Maybe I got married too soon. I felt as if I needed to get something out of my system. It's not as if I didn't love my wife or I was dissatisfied with her. I didn't really feel guilty because I wanted to be with my wife. One day, my wife had a really bad fever, so much so that I took her to the hospital. I was waiting in the waiting room, but since the hospital was a pretty big general one, I got bored quite quickly. I went to go off to find a vending machine. I wanted something to drink. I found one on the corner of the second floor. I stood there flicking through my phone, drinking a canned coffee. I opened up the dating app I downloaded and sent a couple of messages. After a while, I got a response. The message was strange though. All it said was, are you married? I wrote back, well, I'm 35, what do you think? To be honest, the message annoyed me with how blunt it was. No greeting or no casual chit chat. Well. It was my first reply and step into the online dating world. Maybe this is what it's like, I guess. I had a fish on the line and I guess I didn't want to lose her. Yeah, I am married. Is that going to be an issue? 
I replied. Honesty is the best policy, right? After a while, I got a reply. What's your wife's name? It read. What the hell? What a weird reply. Why do you want to know my wife's name? I responded. Tell me your wife's name, came the reply. I regret mentioning that I was married at this point. I can't tell you without any reason. Why do you want to know so badly? I sent back. I tried to keep calm about it. Tell me your wife's name, came the reply again. That was enough for me. I didn't want to keep talking to this person. It wasn't what I had in mind. My phone buzzed. Tell me your wife's name. I decided to block them from messaging and calling me and head back to the waiting room as I didn't like it by the vending machine on the corner of the second floor anymore. I headed to the elevator. When it arrived at my floor and the doors opened, I saw a woman inside. I was surprised as I started to walk in, assuming the elevator would be empty. I nearly bumped into her, so I gave her a kind of apologetic head nod. She didn't react. She looked pretty boring. Tell me your wife's name, I heard her ask out. I bolted out of the elevator, terrified, and ran down the stairs to the waiting room. My wife had finished her medical evaluation and greeted me with a pout. She scolded me for not being there for her. I still don't understand what happened that day. How the hell was any of that possible? Did I just misunderstand what that woman said? Or was this some sort of karmic punishment for me attempting to play around? You know, was there some other force at work that day? All I know is that I've never played around with dating apps since. And I'm glad I didn't go any further with them. If anyone is considering this, then please reconsider. If you love your partner, do not do them wrong. I downloaded a dating app. It was mainly because I was bored, to be honest. I found the profile of someone I went to high school with. I thought that it must have been her, since she was still living in my hometown, and so was I. I checked out her screen name and her hobbies, but the moment I saw her profile, there was no mistake. I decided to shoot her a message to see what she was up to. I always liked her. Our conversation is as follows. Hey, do you remember me? We went to high school together. How are you? I got a reply almost immediately. Oh, hey. Wow, it's been a while. I'm doing great. How about you? Yeah, when I saw your photo, I knew it was you. Well, you haven't changed a bit as you're still as cute as you were in high school. What are you up to these days? I replied. Uh, I'm still studying. Working hard. I'm going to college. She sent back. Hey, are you going to the university that's close by? Seems to be the right choice. It's pretty close. Yeah, that's right, she replied. Yeah, I always thought you would go for. You always did well at school. Uh, not really. The road near my house is under construction. It makes it so hard to study. Oh, do you mean Mason Street? I didn't know that was being worked on. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I think they're building something nearby my house too, she said. Probably in the vacant lot, next to the convenience store. Oh yeah, right. Wow, you remember where I live really well. What else? Ah yes, we used to play by your house all the time when we were kids, didn't we? Of course I remember. Remember that day when we skipped school to hang out in the park? The one right next to your house and we just ate ice cream all day. That was the best. The next reply that came back made my spine turn to ice. Thanks. I know where she lives now. I guessed at this point I wasn't speaking to the girl who I skipped school with all those years ago. I'm guessing that it was a person who wanted to find some information. Maybe a stalker. Did I just give a stalker her address?
This happened one hot summer night a few years ago. I was out with my friend on a drive. He turned to me as I was driving and asked me if I was up for meeting some women. He pulled out his phone and started swiping through Tinder. I agreed since, you know, it's always nice to meet women and I just bought a car. So I had that going for me. Plus, I had the app myself and it was in its height of popularity so I jumped at the chance. You just leave the matching the girls to me, man, I said. I was so full of confidence. I had a bit of reputation back then with the ladies. I'm not exactly proud of it these days. I started swiping and quickly reached my limit, all the while my friend was giggling next to me. After about 20 minutes, I got a match, and as soon as I got the match, I got a message. It was amazing. The message was even better. It said, Hi, what are you up to tonight? You want to spend some time with me and my friend? I think we could have a great night. What do you say? That sent me and my friend into frenzy. We couldn't believe our luck. I asked my friend what he thought, and he literally ripped the phone out of my hand to reply. So, two stupid men took the bait and courageously drove into the night to meet up with these complete strangers without knowing what the hell awaited them. We sped to the agreed meeting point, but we couldn't see anyone there. Without sensing any danger, we pulled into a dark car park in the middle of nowhere. We parked up. The meeting spot was a remote train station parking lot. There was no one around. Red flags should have been going off, but they weren't. We were blinkered by lust, I suppose. I said to my friend, this is pretty weird. They said that they'd be waiting here for us. We were so desperate to meet these women that we got out of the car and took a quick scan of the area, searching for them. I said to my friend that I thought we'd been tricked, that it was a hoax, and then we heard someone shout, Oi! Me and my friend kept silent and started to walk back to my car. Hey, you, what are you looking for? Some guy shouted. Two men started power walking toward us. These guys didn't seem like law-abiding citizens at first glance. Before we knew it, they were approaching the car. I looked at my friend and we didn't need to say a word. We knew these were the guys who set the trap on Tinder for us. Why else were we told to meet at this remote location? We scrambled back into the car as they started jogging toward us. I saw the look in their eyes. They definitely had malicious intent. I sped out of the parking area and they gave chase in their own car. It was terrifying. The thought of what might happen to us if we were caught. Would we be robbed? Beaten? Or something worse? I broke some speed limits that night, but eventually we lost them. I was surprised they followed us for as long as they did. Maybe they wanted something we had. Maybe my new car. I didn't want to go anywhere close to where I or my friend lived, just in case those weird guys were still stalking us from an unseen distance. We just kept driving and agreed to make sure we were about an hour away from our town. We stayed away from our homes until about 4am that night, and then we returned completely exhausted and nerve-wracked. Since that day, I have avoided dating apps. For a bit of context, this happened a few years ago. I live in England and I was 23 at the time. I had come out of a serious long-term relationship at 22. We were engaged. I was absolutely broken. I didn't even think about dating or any type of love interests for at least a year. I worked hard to put myself back together and had seen a counselor. I was also taking anti-anxiety medication. I decided it was time to try and find love again. Big mistake. I met a man on Tinder. He was 27 and seemed really friendly. We hit it off really quickly. We went on a fair few dates and saw each other for a few months. As the relationship progressed, he started to get more and more possessive. He didn't like the fact I had my own job, my own friends, my own house or a close relationship with my family. 
I knew I had to cut things off quickly because it was becoming too much to handle. I could not survive another horrific relationship experience. I was already too fragile. I told him that I still wasn't ready to get serious with someone and needed to spend more time alone to look after myself. He took it well. Relief. Until he reached his own home and the texts and phone calls started. He called me all sorts of horrendous names and then would come back with saying how he's not worthy, how I'm amazing and he's just devastated that he's lost me. I firmly told him that I had meant what I said and that things were not going to happen. He accepted this for a while. I started getting ads on various social media that were fake accounts he had made. He called me on various numbers, withheld numbers, public phone numbers. He turned up on my drive without warning. He turned up at my place of work and harassed a colleague. I threatened him with police action if he did not stop, and I moved back in with my parents as I did not feel safe at home. For months he had tried to contact me in various ways. It became exhausting trying to block him from my life. Then one day he changed his tactics. My grandfather had recently passed away and we were very close. I visited his grave weekly to put flowers on it and sit and think. I arrived one morning and there's a letter on the grave. Only myself and my family ever go there, so I was very confused. It was from Jay, begging me to take him back, telling me he would do anything and everything to make me his again. It got threatening towards the end, and I decided that enough was enough. This had gone too far. I contacted the police and had a restraining order put in place. I am still not confident enough to date again. I guess you could say I'm scarred. Anyway, graveside caller stay away from my family. Nowadays, it's so easy to connect with someone. All you have to do is pick up your phone, download an app, and boom. Now you can see all the eligible bachelors in a close radius without even getting out of bed. But just a year ago, something happened that changed my mind about online dating forever. I was 21 at the time and getting a bit tired of mundane life. I was scrolling through a popular dating app and that's when I saw him. Tall, blonde, blue-eyed, pretty smile, perfect. We instantly matched and agreed on dinner and cuddles at his place. Yes, I know, never go to a stranger's house on the first day. But I was trying to score a home run, if you know what I mean. I shower, slip on my favorite pair of matching knickers, threw on a big t-shirt and shorts, rubbed on my favorite perfume, and I was out the door. When I pulled up to his three-story townhouse, I thought his living arrangement seemed to match up with his line of work, so of course I had no doubt that he was who he said he was. I go up to the door and knock. About 15 seconds later, the most handsome man I've ever laid my eyes on opened the door. Instantly, we connected. We dated for about four weeks, when one day he looks over at me and says, Can I tell you something? Well, of course, babe, I quickly answered, eager to hear what he had to say. He looks me dead in the eyes, straight-faced, and said, When I saw you on that app, I planned on killing you. His hand reaches over and caresses mine. But then I changed my mind, he added. Chills went down my spine as I knew he wasn't joking. Completely paralyzed in fear, I just stared at him. I was unable to speak. I couldn't move. He moves in closer and says, Babe. And that's when I snapped out of it. I grabbed my purse, ran out of his house, blocked and deleted his number, and, quite frankly, deleted the whole app. This happened in 2011. 
I'd just gotten out of a rough relationship a few months prior to this happening. My friends encouraged me to try dating again, so I caved and made a profile on the website, Plenty of Fish. I was surprised with how many messages I'd received within the first few hours. Most were just people saying hi or asking to hook up. I wasn't looking for a hookup, so I ignored those messages. After about a week, a guy roughly an hour away from me messaged. He was cute, so I messaged him back. The conversation was pretty casual at first. He asked if I'd like to go for a coffee sometime. Not thinking anything of it, I said sure. This is where it started to get weird. He started to get pushy and asked when we could grab a coffee. I told him I didn't have my own car so I'd have to borrow my mom's car to meet up with him. He offered to come pick me up, but I wasn't comfortable with that idea. The next message made my blood run cold. It read, I'm sure your hometown isn't that big. If I knocked on a few doors, someone would be able to tell me where you live. Are you crazy? I replied. I'm sorry, but that's kind of creepy. This just pissed him off. He messaged me a couple of times after this. Things like, You know I have a gun. I could shoot you and make you disappear. No one would look for you. You're nothing but a dirty slut. I could kill you. I'll throw you down a well. And no one will ever find you. I was really scared at this point, so I asked him to please leave me alone. He replied with the following. I know where your hometown is. It's not a big town. I can find you. At this point I'd had enough and I blocked him. I reported his account to Plenty of Fish and deleted my account. I was really on edge for the next few weeks after the fact. I was afraid he was actually going to come looking for me. I matched with a guy on Bumble. He seemed like a nice guy, and after talking to him for a bit, I found out he owns and runs a bakery just down the street from my workplace. Since it was the BFF version, I wasn't looking for anything. He told me to drop by his bakery sometime so we could chat, and he could feed me brownies. I popped by one evening, and he was such a sweetheart, getting me to try a few things he baked. Got one of his employees to sing for me, and we went out for a walk to talk about ourselves. He even packed me a few things to take for my mom. I thought it was really sweet. We talked about being just friends and seeing how things pan out. The next day we texted each other all day, and he asked me out for lunch. He took me to a five-star hotel. Things were going pretty normal until he started feeding me with his hand, and then he asked if he could hold my hand. I agreed because I did not want to create a scene at fine dining, and he started talking about being in a relationship and how happy I make him. He said he would like to call me his baby, and said he wants this to go on for as long as possible and eventually get married. He talked about how he wants to spoil me and build an empire so I don't have to work for money. I couldn't speak up because the restaurant was so quiet, and I didn't know how he would react. He kept touching my face, kissing my forehead, and mouthing I love you to me. I was frozen, and the thing that scared me the most was we ordered coffee after the last meal, and he started shouting to call the waiter and said we've been waiting for 30 minutes for coffee when it'd only been a few minutes. I was so embarrassed and scared and tried to calm him down. Now he keeps calling me baby and texting me sweet things calling me on the phone when I don't reply to his messages. He said he doesn't know anything about me, but he's fallen for me. We've only met twice and spoken maybe for five or six days. He said his first love passed away, and he's been struggling mentally since then. And after having lost a lot of close ones after the incident, he says he's been able to finally get a full night's sleep after he met me. He kept calling me and talks about getting married. I finally sent him a message, saying I thought he was a sweet person, 
but it was getting too much for me to handle when we didn't even know each other. I've blocked him from everywhere and started taking a different route to and from work. I was so scared and thinking about it too much was taking a toll on me. I felt so relieved after sending the message and blocking him. I use Tinder pretty frequently, and it's usually cool. Just meeting people, chilling, smoking with most of them. So I match with this one guy named Charlie, and he seems cool. He's really cute, and he plays music, which is really appealing to me as I also sing and play piano. We talk for a little while, and I agree to meet him at his house. Mistake number one. Why did I think it was a good idea to meet a stranger in their home? I don't drive, so I take an Uber over. It's a decent way away, so it's kind of pricey. When he buzzes me into the apartment complex, I got this really creepy vibe, but I shook it off his nerves. I go up to the third floor, and he's standing at the door. Things are cool. We're just chilling. We smoke a couple of bowls, and we're watching a movie. So he makes a move on me, and I go with it. We end up on the bed and we're obviously engaged in adult activities, when out of nowhere, he wraps his hand around my neck, hard. Now that's all fine and good with me, I mean I can dig that in the right setting, but alone in a stranger's house, when he didn't even check to see if it was cool, is not one of those settings. So I literally can't breathe, and I'm fairly certain I'm turning blue at this point, and he's just relentless. He's now yelling in my face. Are you scared? With this wild look in his eyes. I'm like, fuck yes I'm scared. You're trying to kill me right now. I started to struggle and he was gripping even harder. I'm not even kidding you guys. I seriously thought I was going to die. By some miracle, I wriggle out of his grasp and start screaming. He's yelling at me to calm down and I'm frantically trying to put my clothes on. He grabs my wrist as I'm trying to leave, and I use all of my strength to pull away from him and slam the door. I get home and I look in the mirror, and I have a hell of a bruise on my neck. I try to cover it up with makeup to no avail. I straight up look like I was almost strangled to death. Benny texts me saying, I think you need more than one dick. And I'm like, oh really? You want to bring a friend and kill me together? How lovely. Anyways, I blocked him and reported him on Tinder. I wish I could have done more, because I seriously think he would have killed me. I've been debating going to the police, but the bruises are gone, and it's a he said, she said thing. But I'm really starting to wonder if I should, because the next girl might not be so lucky. About 10 years ago, when I was about 20 years old, I'd been seeing this guy who treated me like garbage and never wanted to make it official. I was really hung up and figured the best way to get over him was to find someone else to occupy my time, so I made the leap to online dating. Online dating at this time was not a picture and swiping. It was a sea of cringy bios and lists of likes and dislikes a mile long. Anyways... On one of these online dating stints, I would go on every six months or so. I met this overly friendly guy who was very determined for a cup of coffee. I begrudgingly agreed and met him at a local Starbucks. But I had a friend of mine meeting me there in about an hour or two as a backup. While this guy was a little short, he was kind of cute. He kind of resembled Andy Samberg. He would stare at me without blinking for long periods of time and never took his eyes off of me. Like, at all. Anyway, he started calling me the Selena to his Justin. Within 15 minutes of meeting, I got creeped, and luckily my friend showed up early, so I bailed. Fast. While I was walking away, this guy just stood there, watching as I sat with my friend to work on our project for university. 
He didn't move a muscle for almost half an hour, except to send me text after text such as, See you later, baby, and I'm so lucky to have found you. When we finally left, I got to my car. I finally responded to his texts and shut him down as nicely as possible, but while being clear I had no intention of ever seeing him again. Then I blocked him. Fast forward a week and I'm walking out of my local dollar store, located in the same lot as the Starbucks I met him at, when I see him standing by my car in the parking lot. Praying he didn't see me, I booked it into the Walmart next door, crouched in the crowd. This man must have seen me, because I see him enter the Walmart scanning avidly. I took my chance and ran back to my car like a track star. While leaving the parking lot stuck in a line of cars, this guy walks alongside my car, just staring at me, waiting for me to look over. While finally pulling out of the lot, I see him in my rear view, still standing there, staring. Needless to say, I took a long break from online dating, and deleted my account. Extremely concerned, this guy hung out in the shopping complex for a week, waiting to see me. I avoided it as much as possible, for as long as possible. It was 2018. I just moved out of my parents' place for the first time, into a little flat in my local area. I was 24 and was also newly single, so I decided to download Tinder to see what it was all about. I started chatting to some guy. Truth be told, I was actually talking to a few guys over the course of a couple of weeks or so. Anyway, this guy asks me out and I wasn't feeling it. I made up some excuse. We continued to chat for another week or so. Now it was a Friday evening. I had just finished work and was walking home when I checked my phone. I had a message from this guy asking me out again. It also asked me what time I wanted picking up. I made up an excuse again and dismissed it. I finally got back home to my flat and began my weekly routine of cleaning and sorting out my laundry when I heard a knock at my door. I wasn't expecting anybody. I stopped what I was doing and walked into the kitchen and peered out the window to see who it was before I opened the door. Stood there was a dark-haired man holding a small bunch of flowers. I was confused. I opened the door and I can only imagine how confused I must have looked. He said his name and I just stood there, confused as to how he even knew where I lived. He continued to tell me to get my coat and that we were going out, but I kept telling him I couldn't go. I asked him how he knew where I lived, as I'd only just moved in, and he told me that he'd tell me if I went out with him. I refused. He then asked if he could at least come in. I said no. It took me a solid ten minutes of back and forth talking before he left. When he left, he gave me the flowers and said bye. Thankfully, it was broad daylight, and I had neighbors opposite my front door, watching in the corner of their eyes. Anyways, once I closed my front door, I messaged him, asking again how he found out my address. He wouldn't tell me. He just kept saying he knew people. I then followed this up with a message, telling him not to contact me ever again, and that him showing up uninvited is not acceptable especially when I never even told him where I lived to begin with. I threw the flowers he gave me in the bin, and to this day, I have not spoken to him since. I also moved out of the flat after my six-month initial term was up. I'm guessing he was trying to be spontaneous and romantic, but it just ended up being really creepy. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you can't get enough Mr. Revenant content, check out the perks of my Patreon and channel membership. Details are in the description. I want to say a special thanks to those already supporting the channel.
So huge thanks to Sarah C, Brenda, Sharon and Ashley, Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Cow, K, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey, Sarah T, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Astara Rain, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you all for listening, guys. I'll see you in the next one.